Welcome to Live Doc, your online Doc Yomi Shear. Shalom, welcome back to today's Daf, which is the Erevin Daf Nun Gimel. We're beginning a new parak on Nun Beis, on Beis, towards the bottom. It says the Mishnah, Ketzad Ma'abrina Sa'arim. How are we meant to do Ibor to a city? So speaking about establishing the municipal borders of a town, so we can go ahead and create the territory, the Tchum, around the municipal boundary of the city. Now, not all cities have uh, borders which are straight lines. You have perhaps a house that's sticking out. You have protrusions of all types. The mission will tell us that we're meant to extend the boundary of the city up until the point of that protrusion. Kate said Ma'abrin So actually says Ma'abrin is like an expectant woman, which is an extension of the person. Likewise, a city has an extension, meaning that the boundaries are meant to extend up until they're equal to the protrusions, which are extending beyond the boundaries of the city. It says the Mishnah, Kate said Ma'abrin Asar, Bayis Nichnas, Bayis Yoytze, if you have a house going in, a house going out, there's no wall around the city, it's surrounded by houses. So you have one going in, one going out, it's in a zigzag, or Pogum Nichnas, Pogum Yoytze. If you have a wall, but the wall has uh, watchtowers, lookouts, and it's Pogum Nichnas, Pogum Yoytze, meaning there's a protrusion going in, going out, it's not a straight line, rather, it's like a zigzag. Or Hoyisham Gedudiyos, Kvayis Asar Tfachim. You had some wall remnants there, some structural remnants which were ten fachim high, which were protruding at protruding out of the city. Or you have the ugsharim, these bridges or nafashis, these matzevis on the kaver sheyeshbam base dira, going back to the bridges which have a base dira, uh, perhaps a hut for the tax collector for the um, toll collector. So they have a place of dwelling. So in all these cases, what do we do? How do we set the boundaries of the city? We take the mida, the measurement, the, the, we delineate the boundary of the city, connect them opposite those protrusions. So for instance, if you have one side of the city, let's say the east of the city, which has on one side of it a, a house sticking out, and this protrusion is not present on the other side of the east, boundary of the city. Nevertheless, we take a straight line from the protrusion and mark it straight down all along the east side of that city. So we envision as though the city extends, the east side of that city extends all the way to where the protrusion is. So we are mighty the middle connector opposite that protrusion, that becomes the boundary of the city. Continues the Mishnah. This is another factor. Let's say we have a, a round city. We don't measure a tchum from the circle of the city. Rather, we form it into a square tray. We box it. We create straight angles around the city. We have four corners of 90 degree angles around that city. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a square. Perhaps it's a rectangle. The point is we create straight lines around that city even if it's a round city, Kadeshi and Iskar says obvious, so that he gains the benefits from those corners, which you've created around that round city. So it's really supposed to be a round city with a round tchum around it, giving you a radius of, of 2,000 nama. Rather, we work with a square. We create a box around that city. So he's going to gain because the corners are not really inhabited but are considered to be part of the city, and then the 2,000 Amma are drawn beyond that square, beyond that box. So in two things in our mission, number one, regarding establishing the actual municipal boundaries of the town itself, we work with the furthest point, with the farthest protrusion, and we create a box around that, we draw a straight line along the protrusion and Rashi points out that provided the uh, protrusion was the um, was within seventy, about seventy amos in the city, as we're going to learn later in the Gemara. That's number one. Number two, when it comes to actually creating this, forming the the shape of the city 
which will serve the basis of the tchum beyond it, we meant to envision it like a, a square, like a box, like a rectangle, and then measure the tchum beyond that. And this gives him some extra space in the corners. Sheiniskar esazavius. We'll learn this from the Gemara later. Psukim cities are meant to be established as boxes, as squares, straight angles. When it comes to measuring the tchum. Continues the Gemara. So we began with Ketzad Ma'abrin Esa'arim. So Rashi tells us that Ma'abrin is a lotion of Ishu Ubar, like an expectant woman. Likewise here, we're extending the city opposite those protrusions. Now we actually have Machlegis between Rav, Ushmo, Chad, Toni, Ma'abrin. One spelled it with an Ayin, Ma'abrin. Machad, Toni, Ma'abrin. The other one spelled it with an Aleph. Explains the Gemara. Man, the Toni, Ma'abrin, Aver, Aver. Ma'avrin is like a limb, because these are limbs coming out of the city. Uman the Tani Ma'avrin, the other one who had the ayin, Kishu Bara, like an expectant woman. On account of this machlekes, the Gemara brings several other machlekes in Ramah Shmuel regarding precise spelling and meaning of words. Ma'ar Samach Pela, a double K which was used by Avraham Avinu to bury Sarah, we have machlekes between Ramah Shmuel. Chad Omar, Shnei Batim, Zelef Nimezeh. There were two rooms, one inside the other. That's why it was called Marasa Machpelah. The Chadam, the other one said, Bayez Vali Al Gabov. It was actually a two floored cave. Bishlemi Lamandam Ar Zeh Al Gav Zeh. So it's understood according to the one who says, it was a double floored cave, Hainu Machpelah. That's why it was called Machpelah, a double cave. El Lamandam Ar Shni Batam Zelif Nima Zeh. However, according to the other approach, that it was merely due to the fact that it had two rooms. My machpela. Why machpela? That's called a double cave. Just because it had two rooms. Says the Gemara, Shachfula bezugais. The reason why it was called machpela because it was full of bezugais. It contained and accommodated many couples. As Morrison will tell us, it had Adam v'Chava, Avram v'Sar, etc. As we learn from the pasuk of Mamre Kiris Arb, this was the description of Chevron. It was a place which had four. What does that mean? On Rabbi Yitzchak Kiryas, it was a town that had Ha'arba Zogos accommodated four couples who were buried there. Which uh, were the four couples? Adam Vachava, Abram Vesara, Yitzchak Verifka, Yaakov Alea. So that's why it was called Kiryas Arba, an account of these four couples who were buried there. The Pasuk says, Vahibi Me'am Rafal. This was when the war broke out in the time of Ramavinu. So the Pasuk describes, begins describing the story with the days. It was in the days of Amraphel, or some king. So we have Machlekes regarding the precise meaning of this word, of this Pasuk. Rav Shmuel, Machlekes in Rav Shmuel. Chad Amar Nimrod Shmuel, his true name was Nimrod. Why then was he called Amraphel? On account of his actions. She'amar, because he instructed Vihipol Avram Avinu, he threw Avram Avinu, he instructed them to throw Avram Avinu into the burning furnace. So his true name was Nimrod. Am Rafael is an account of what he did. Amar v'hip. That's one approach. V'chad Amar. The other one holds. Actually, Am Rafael Shmoy. That was his true name. V'lom nikr Shmoy Nimrod. Why was he called Nimrod? Due to his actions. Shehimrod es kolayim kuloy olav malchusay. Because he brought the whole world to rebel against Hashem's kingdom. We have another machlek in Rav Shmo regarding the pasuk of Ayakam Melachadish Amitzrayim. So no king got up and began his reign in Mitzrayim. He was actually a new king. He wasn't new. Rather, his decrees were renewed. The Shita says he was actually a new king. Why? It says, The knowing that he was indeed a new king. Now what is the raya of the Shita that says that he wasn't actually a new king, but his gzeros were renewed. What's his proof? Because we don't find that the Pasuk says, Vayamas, Vayimlech, that one king died and the other one took over. Apparently, it was one and the same person. According to the view that his gzeros were renewed, but he was one and the same fellow, he was still the same old pari. Doesn't the Pasuk say that he was unfamiliar with Yosef? Now, if he was the same pari, as uh, the one during the time of Yosef, why, why, why didn't he know Yosef? Says the Gemara, Maish lo yada Yosef. What does that mean? He wasn't familiar 
with Yosef, Davadomi, he presented himself, Yosef Klal, as though he wasn't familiar with Yosef. It was just a pretense, but certainly he knew Yosef very well. Continues the Gemara, Om Rav Yechna, Yudches Yomim Gidalti, Eitzel Rav Yoshia Beribi. I spent 18 days with Rav Yoshia the Great One, who was the Great One in his generation. And the only thing I managed to learn from him throughout this entire period was Eladavar Echad Mishnah Seinu. Only one thing pertaining to our Mishnah, how I went to spell the word Ma'abrin. Kate said Ma'abrin is Arim Ba'alaf. I meant to use an Aleph. So it was worth the entire effort just for this one bit of information. Says Ma'aini, is that so? He only learned one thing. He had 12 Tamidim. I spent 18 days amongst them. And I was able to discern the, the heart, the, the um, analytical abilities of each, each and every one of those Tamidim. And their intellectual abilities. So apparently he learned much more than just one thing. Says the Gemara, Leiv Kalechad Ve'echad. Vechachmas, kolechad ve'echad, gomar. He discerned their, their abilities, their capacity, that, that he was able to, to see. But gemar like gomar. But in actuality, he never learned anything concrete, any halacha, any gemar, aside from that thing regarding the ketzad ma'avr. He bought the same on alapshat. Minayu did hu gomar. He learned much from them. But minayu did heilu gomar. But from the Ishibu Rebbe himself, the Rebbe, he actually only managed to learn one thing. He learned many things pertaining to Brises, to Gemaris, but only one thing pertaining to a Mishnah. When we would learn Torah by Rabbi Rebbe, we would crane ourselves, we would squeeze ourselves to get close to him, to listen to his Torah. We would station ourselves four people in each Amma. Amma Rabbi, Kshayinu Lain and Torah, Shall Lazar and Shamor? When we would learn Torah by Lazar and Shamor, Hayinu Yashvin, Shisha Shisha Bama. We would sit six together, even in one Amma, a small, tiny area. Masha says it was a, it was a Masa Nisim, it was a miracle. For Rabbi Yechanan, Rabbi Yeshia Beribe Bedairi. Rabbi Yeshia Beribe, in his generation, so surpassed the capacity of his colleagues, just like Kuramea Bader, as Ramea was greater than his colleagues in his generation. Ma Ramea Bader, just as Ramea in his generation, you so deep that his friends couldn't comprehend the the depth of his positions. Ah, Rabbi Yisha, likewise, Rabbi Yisha, loyachlu chaverov, lama desev daita, they couldn't comprehend the depth. Of his shita, of his opinions. But Rabbi Yechanan, there's such a contrast between the abilities of the former generations and our current generation. Liban shulrish shaynim, the hearts, the, the capacity, the analytical abilities of the former generations, their hearts were so wide. Kipitzah shalulam, like the width of the Pesach of the Ulam, which was 20 amas wide. Shalach reinim, in contrast to the Later generations, whose capacities have diminished to such a great extent, kepisl shal echel, half the size, it's equated to the opening of the hechel, which is merely ten amas wide. Va'anu, and we are kimlei nekev machad sidkis. Our hearts have become so constricted, our abilities so limited, merely like the pinol kimlei nekev, like the pinol of the machad sidkis, this thin. Sewing needle used to repair cracks in uh, clothing. So it's a thin needle with a small pinhole. That's how constricted our hearts are. Says more Rishonim Rabbi Kiva. Who was he referring to when he said the Rishonim, the early generations of Rabbi Kiva? Achroinim, the latter ones, are Rabbi Lezben HaShemur. Igedam Rishonim have a different approach. Rishonim was Rabbi Lezben HaShemur. Achroinim, Rabbi Shabaribi. Va'onu. And we, us, it's Rabbi Yechon speaking, we're so small, like the pinhole 
of the sewing needle. Amr Abai. He describes it a bit differently regarding the diminished capacity of the later generations. Va'anan, when it comes to, to learning and to grasping Torah, ki sikhsa beguda legemara. We created like a, a peg, like a nail being driven into a wall with much difficulty until it gets in there. That's how hard it is for us to comprehend learning. It's hard for us to, to understand and comprehend it. Amarava, when it comes to svara, to, to analyzing and delving into the depth of the true meaning of the Torah, this is how it's described. Vanan, by us, ki adds ba'asa bekirla svara. When it comes to svara, we have difficulty. It's very difficult, like the finger, at the ba'asa, being driven into a, a hard piece of wax. So, it, it doesn't get in too easily. Likewise, we have a very difficult time truly comprehending the depth, the true meaning of the Torah. Amr of Asher, when it comes to memory, look at this, Anan ketz ba'asa b'bira l'shikha. When it comes to shikha, we're like a finger going in and out of a pit, just slides in and out easily. That's how quickly the Torah just gets forgotten for us. We have a hard time retaining and remembering the Torah. This brings a different pshat. He says, ketz ba'asa b'bizri. Like a person who puts his finger into into a mustard seed. So he creates this, this little hole there, but as soon as he pulls out his finger, the seeds just go back in their place. So likewise, when we learn one Masechta, when we begin another Masechta, we immediately forget the first Masechta. So that's how limited we are. And we meant to take these limited capacities and our um, restricted talents and plug away and learn with our Kaychas. Amr Abid Amraf. We have the Bnei Yehuda, we have the Bnei Gol. People lived in different vicinities in Israel. So there was a difference between the two. Bnei Yehuda was successful in their learning, the Bnei Gol were not. The Gemara explain why. Bnei Yehuda Shekpida Alashaynam. They were makvit on their wording, on their diction, to speak clearly, articulately. As a result of that, the Skyma Torasam Biyodim. The Torah was retained by them. They, they were able to keep their Torah. But in Galil, Shalayik Bidal Shaina, contrast to the people living in Gal, who are not very careful with their diction and their mode of speech. They uh, they would mumble and weren't very careful with their choice of words. When the Skyma Surasam Biyadam, as a result, the terror was not properly retained by them. Says the more why are these two things related? Midi bikpeda talimusa. Retention of terror is dependent on being particular with choice of words. Why? Ella rather as follows. The Bnei Yehuda, the Daiki Lishna, the Bnei Yehuda who paid attention, close attention to the precise wording of the Torah which was taught to them. And that, that enabled them to create simonim, formulas to remember the Torah because it was so clearly articulated in their, in their minds. They had the, the wording so clear. Umas nechilu simonim. And they would place simonim to remember the Torah. As we find many times in, the, in Shas, that the Gemara says similar. Like right here in our Ahmed, we have further back up the second line, second wide line. We have Simon Shmoyne Esrei Shneim Asar. So we find many times the Gemara would string together different halachas, different stories, using just a few choice words, so that one could uh, grab the many halachas in that manner. It helps a person commit it to his long-term memory. So in any case, the Bnei Yehuda, who were very wordy very particular and medaic in the halachas, in the words of the halachas that they were taught by the Rebbeim. This allowed them to apply these formula of the simonim in order to remember it. Niskayim at Rasam therefore the Torah was retained by them, in contrast to the Bnei Golo. The Lai Daiki Lishna, who didn't pay close attention to the wording of the Torah that they were taught, didn't allow them to employ this method. Vlai Mas Nechalu Simana, they weren't able to apply the simonim, as a result, they didn't have the proper tools to remember the Torah so well. In the Skyma, Terasam Biyada. Another reason for the discrepancy between the success of Bnei Yehuda versus the Bnei Gal, Bnei Yehuda Gomer Mechad Rabba learned the Torah from one Rebbe consistently. In the Skyma, Terasam Biyada, the Torah was retained. Bnei Gal, the Loi Gomer Mechad Rabba. However, the Bnei Gal who didn't learn it just from one Rebbe, they had many 
Rabbeim, when it's coming to Rosh Hashanah, due to confusion, discrepancy in style and approach, the Torah was not retained properly in their hands. Now, Thesis points out, based on the Gemara of the Zorah, actually, it is preferred to go learn from many Rabbeim. That the Gemara says, It's not good to only learn from one Rebbe. So Thesis says, how does this work with Al Gemara? He says, it depends if we're speaking about the actual facts, the facts, the knowledge, the, the Mishnah, or, or the facts of the Gemara. We went to stay with one Rebbe, and, and, and that, that adds consistency to your learning. That's one style, that's one girsa. It avoids confusion. As opposed to, to the next level, which is svara, to delve and analyze into the, into the meaning, into the svara of Torah, when it comes to that, it's actually better not to stay with one Rebbe, rather go experience different approaches, different shitas, different uh, uh, positions, different ways of, of thinking and analyzing. That's actually better. Enriches a person's intellect and his analytical abilities. So here we're speaking about the, just the facts, the Gemara. That we're meant to learn from one Rebbe, so things are clear and consistent, without confusion. Ravina Amar, another reason for the success of Nehuda was as follows. Nehuda, the goal of Masechda. They would teach the Masechda Torah to others, and it's coming to us and As a result of that, it was Zeicha to retain the Torah properly, and they go the Loi Gol Masechda. Who did not teach their learning to others, and it's coming to us and they did not merit to retain the Torah properly. David, David Hamalach, Goli Masechta. He would teach Torah to others. Shaul Hamalach, no, like Goli Masechta, he wouldn't teach to others. What does it say as a result? David, Goli Masechta, Ksivbe Yurei Echa, Yuruni Vismachu. Your fair ones will see me and be happy because he had the ability to um, have clarity in Torah and to, uh, to give uh, Piske Halacha in Torah. And this was as a result of his Siyat Shmaya, because he would teach Torah to others. Shor, the Lord called him a Sechta. In contrast to Shor, who did not teach to others, he was not Zeich to the same level of learning. Ksivbei el kol asher yifnei yashir. Wherever he turned, he was wicked. And Rashi learns that it just means that he was not Zeich to conclude with the same clarity as of HaMelech. And this was because he didn't, he didn't get himself involved in teaching Torah to others. Continues more with one more aspect regarding Shalom which is actually a bit unrelated. Where do we find that Hakadosh Baruch Hu forgave Shaul for the chait of Noi Virakahan who killed out? This was when Shaul communicated with Shmuel after Shmuel's death. He wanted to know whether he should go pursue the um, Plishtim and the Melchama. And Shmuel responded, Tomorrow, you're going to come to Eilam Abba, you and your sons, together with me. So, Imi, we learn, Imi Mimchitsasi, together with me in my enclosure, meaning in Eilam Abba. Apparently, Hashem was Meichel Shol Amelech, for Zavir. Continues the Gemara. Omar Ab Abba, Iika de Mishaluhu, Levna Yehuda, the Daiki Lishna. If there could be somebody that can go ask, the people of Yehuda who were particular with the Lashon, with the wording, we're going to ask them the following question. Our mission says, Ketad Ma'avrin We want to know whether Ma'avrin Tnan went to spell with an Aleph, like an Aver, or Ma'avrin Tnan with an Ayin, like an expectant woman. We have another question for them. This is regarding a halach in the mission of Bechiris. So they would take the Bechir to check if he had a Mum, and they would place him on the uh, on his, his hind, lower hind, li- lower backside, and the Mishnah describes it as Akuzoi, Meshivin Yisrael Akuzoi. The question is, how is that meant to be spelled? Akuzoi Tnan with an Aleph, or Akuzoi Tnan with an Ayin? So we have these two questions regarding spelling, Aleph Ayin. So if somebody would go ask Ibn Yehuda, who is certainly a proficient with this, uh, with this detail, Yadi, then we would know. Shilinu. So somebody went to ask them, but Amrile, and they told him, Ika de Tani Ma'abrin. Ika Tani Ma'abrin. It can go both ways. Some learn with an Aleph, some learn with an Ayin. That's pertaining to our Mishnah. 
Likewise, pertaining to the other question, Ikadatani Akuzoi, Ikadatani Akuzoi. Some spell with an Aleph, Akuzoi, and some with an Ayin. Continues the Gemara. B'nei Yehuda the Daiki Lishnamai. So we mentioned that the people of Yehuda were exact with their addiction and with their choice of words. The one would tell us that this wasn't only pertaining to matters of Torah, but they would conduct themselves in this manner even when it came to just worldly matters. And the Lord actually would tell us that the Bnei Gol, who uh, would mumble and weren't so particular with their choice of words, would, uh, would cause confusion, actual, actually bring about some comical misunderstanding that the Gemara will tell us. Okay, so let's see some examples. Bnei Yehuda the Daiki Lishnamai. What is an example of a Bnei Yehuda who were particular with their wording? The Ahubar Yehuda, there was this fellow from Yehuda, the Amalu, who announced to them, Talis Yeshi Limkar. I have this garment for sale. Amr so they asked him, Ma govan talischa? What, uh, what color is it? Amr he was very precise in his description. Kitshrodin ali adama. Like the leaves of the beets above the ground. Meaning, it's not like the beet in the ground, which is not green, but the leaves of beets, which are still connected to the ground. So it's a very specific shade of green, he was very exact and precise in his description of the color of his garment. So that's the Bnei Yehuda. In contrast to the Bnei Gola, the Loidaiki, the Lishna, they weren't very exact and precise in their articulation. Mai, what is an example of such? Glila, there was this fellow from Gol. He was walking along with Amr and he announced like this. Amr Laman, Amr Laman. He wanted to purchase an Amr. Now, due to the fact that he was mumbling and didn't speak clearly, they didn't hear clearly what he was trying to say. Um, Amr they told him, Glilo Shaita, you foolish fellow from Gol. Do you mean Chamar? Because Amar could sound like Chamar. Chamar le Mirka? You want to purchase a donkey to ride on it? Or Chamar le Mishti? Or some wine to drink? Amar le Mulbash? Some wool to wear? Or Imar le Kasa? Or perhaps a lamb to Shech? Hayi Itza, there was this woman, the boy le Meim le Chavert. She wanted to be gracious, be gracious and invite her friend over for a drink of milk. So she wanted to say, Shlufti, my friend, Toi de chalba. I'm going to come and I will give you some chalba, some milk to drink. Instead, she said, Amrla, Shluchti, which doesn't mean anything, Toichlech, Lovi. Lovi is a female lion. She'll devour you, she'll eat you up. So, um, it sounded pretty scary. To the fact that she didn't bother expressing her words clearly. There was this woman who approached a dayan. And she was complaining about her tray, a large size tray, which was stolen from her. So Amrle, she told him. She wanted to tell him like this. She had a mind to say, Rashi explains, Kiri with a kuf, meaning my master. I had a tabla, a tray, and the gunvuch, min, was, it was stolen from me. And it was so was so large in size. This is how it was. Could I have us that if you would, if I would go ahead and lie on it, my feet wouldn't reach, reach, reach the ground. So this is what she had in mind. But instead, she mumbled and she came across very unclear. Amalei, she told me like this: Mori, Mori Kiri. Kiri actually says the lashon of Eved, my servant. So she's addressing the judge in a disrespectful manner. Tafla. Instead of tavla, which is a tree, tavla obviously had this beam, the gonvuch min, which sounds like they stole you. The kadoy havis. Instead of saying the kadan havis, this is what it was. Kadoy, now it was. So she's just sounding confusion here. The kad shadru loch iluyo. If they would put you, hang you, she's speaking to the judge on this tray. This is, again is disrespectful. Limati karach ari, your feet wouldn't reach the ground. So. She didn't articulate her words clearly, and she created confusion and lack of respect. Says Umar, Amos Adivei Rebbe. So this maidservant in the home of Rebbe, who was quoted actually several times in the Gemara, she apparently was a wise woman. When she would speak in a Lashon of Chachmam, Amrahach, she would say as follows. So apparently there were guests, Talmidim, who were eating in the house of Rebbe, and when there was no wine left, she would say like this, Alas, Alas is the pitcher which is sitting in the barrel, 
Nakvas is already banging the kad on the bottom of the barrel, meaning there's no wine left. Yidun nishraya lekinayim. The um, eagles should, should go back to their nests. Mashal explains that she was trying to send them a message to go home. Nails over. So she chose these words in order to convey the message in an indirect and diplomatic way, in a respectful way. When she wanted them to stay there, to sit, uh, sit further, she would tell them, that the um, lid on top of Chaverta should be removed from it. Meaning we're going to open a new barrel, the Siskafi Alas Bekat. And uh, as a result, the Alas, the pitcher, will float inside this barrel, Ki Ilfa like a ship floating in the ocean. So Yadi Basar Chaverta Mina means, Yadi means we're going to remove Basar, the lid Chaverta, from its friend, from the next barrel, Mina, from it, in order to allow the meal to continue. Now, there's another pshat in the Gemara here, another Gersa, that learns that she was actually addressing the host, Rebbe. She didn't want them to understand, so she would ask him, look, there's um, the uh, pitcher which has hit the bottom of the barrel. Would you like to continue? Send them, would you like to send them home? Or would you like us to open another another barrel so that the, uh, the thing will float again? And uh, they can go ahead and stick around. And the gears according to that is that Rav Rebbe would respond to her, no, let's remove another lid from the next barrel. So according to this approach, the reason why she spoke in cryptic language is so that they shouldn't understand what she was trying to say. Okay, so she spoke in Lashon Chachma, in, uh, in wise language, picking the right choice of words to convey her message. Rabbi Yisab Asyan, Ki Ava Mishtoi B'Lashon Chachma, when he wanted to speak in a Lashon of Chachma, Rashi says so that others don't understand. Omar, he said like this, prepare my food as follows. Asoli shor v'mishpat. Prepare for me a shor, an ox. V'mishpat, in judgment. So, shor in Aramaic is tur, tur. V'mishpat can mean also din. So what it meant was trodden. Trodden are beets. So prepare, prepare for me Sherba Mishpat, which is just another way of saying Trudin, Turden, beats. Bitur Miskin, Tur is a mountain in Aramaic. Tur in Hebrew is Har, a mountain. Miskin, poor. So another word for poor is Dal. So Bitur Miskin means Behar Dal, Behar Dal. Prepare for me beets in mustard. Vekadav Hashal Bishpiza. When Rabbi Yesi wanted to ask uh, for advice regarding a specific host. Omar Hachi, so he used cryptic language so that it's not understood by all. He spoke in a riddle form. He wanted to know whether the Ushpiza is of any good. So he said like this. He referred to the word Ushpiza uh, with the following words, a compilation of the following words. Gvar, means a man, so it's, uh, it's Ish, the beginning of the word Ushpiza. Gvar is Ish. Pum, a mouth, so P, so Ush P, Dain, this, so Ush P, Zu, so that's how he got to the word Ush Piza, in a riddle form. I want to know if this host is Chai, he's alive, meaning, is he good? And in reference to his wife, he said, Mazu Toy Vayesh, does she have any good? This is a way of asking, inquiring as to the quality of a specific hotel. When he spoke in a Lashon Chachm, he said like this, Have Amar Hachi, Asrigulu Pachamin. Get the Pacham and the coals, all worked up, all red, like the Esrig. Fire up the coals, Arkeel is a haven. Spread out the coals, which were uh, colored gold, gold coals. So prepare the coals, Vasuli Shnei Magidei Balot, and prepare for me two chickens. Magide means they inform Balata. In the darkness, they indicate the changeover between night and day. So this was his way of asking them to prepare for him 
two roasted chickens. Ikadami, another version was, Vyasli Bahen, prepare for me in them and those coals, Shnei Magidi Valata, two of these chickens. Amulei Rabbanan Rabavo. The Talmidim approached Rabbi Avo with the following request. Hatsbi Nenu, can you show us Hechan Rabbi Loi Tzafon? Where Rabbi Loi is hiding out? We can't find him. Amr Lehansi told him, you know why he can't find him? Because he's actually catching up on some sleep. He was up late into the night. Why? Olad's Benara, he was joyous with Einar Aharoinis. Aharoinis, Iranis, Venirasai. This is a cryptic response to which the Gemara has two approaches. Amrila Isha, some say he was referring to an Isha who kept him up, but Amrila Masechta. Some say it was a Masechta that kept him up. So according to the version that it was an Isha, this is what he meant to say. Olad's Benara, he was joyous with a young woman, Aharoinis. A Kahenis, a descendant of Aaron Akoin, who was actually his second wife, Iranis. She was a sharp woman, Vinirasi, and due to her sharpness, she kept him up. They were engaged in deep, meaningful conversations. So this is according to the approach that it was an Isha that kept him up. Some say that he's referring to a Masechta. So what he meant to say was, Olad's Benara, he was joyous with a Nara young woman, which is a marshal to a Masechta in Torah. Which Masechta was it? Aroinus. It was from Seder Kachim, which contains the halachas of Karbonis, pertaining to Arna Koyin and his descendants. Ach Aroinus was actually the second Masechta that he was learning that night. Ironis, a sharp Masechta, and Irasai, which kept him up. So it's either the Masechta or the Isha. You know, I once read a letter that Rabbi Kivega wrote after his wife's passing. He was so heartbroken and it was in response to a person who suggested a shidduch to him. And he responded very sharply. He says, how could you even suggest something like this? In this moment, I'm so broken. My wife just passed away. I'm in mourning. I, we were so close. And he describes, he writes that they used to have such meaningful discussions. They used to conduct these deep conversations late into the night. <laughs> he says, you know, I miss her so much. How, how could you even entertain the concept of, of remarriage. So eventually he, um, he overcame, he, ran, he remarried, I think he ma- married his wife's sister. So that's the, uh, the Isha, the Isha that kept him up late into the night. So it's either the Isha or the Masechta that he's referring to. Continues the Gemara, Amrilei, little Biloi. So this time the Talmidim asked Rabiloi, Hatzpinenu, can you show us Hechen Rabbi Vohutzaf? Where's Rabbi Vohu hiding? We, we want to try to find him. Amr Lehans, he told him, he is actually located elsewhere. Nisiyayitz v'machter, he went to get um, rishus, to get permission, to get smicha, from the Nasi, who is referenced as the Machter. Machter is a lotion of Keser, a crown. So the Nasi would endow, would grant permission to, for a person to, to be called a, a Rebbe. He would give smicha. So, Rabbi Vo received smicha, and then he went to the Chacham and Behingif, When he got the uh, smicha here, he went south. So Hingif means he went Negev south, Mephibayshis. To spend time with the other Chachamim. And the Chachamim, the people in Zikne, in, in Dorim, are great Chachamim. And that's why they're called Mephibayshis, because Mephibayshis was actually also a great wise man, a big Chacham. Continues the Gemara. Omar Meshua ben Hananiah, me Yomai, my entire life, lo nitzchani Adam, nobody was victorious against me when it came to uh, debate and conversation. He was very talented when it came to conducting debates against the uh, heretics, etc. So, despite his great talent, and nobody was ever menatzeach me, nobody ever prevailed against me, Except, he says, except for three times. Chutz mi isha tinek Three times it happened that I was won over. So Ben Yadah explains that he was being humble despite my great capacity and my, and my uh, debating abilities. I was won over three times. Isha mai. What is the story with the isha? Who won him over? Pamachas nesarachti etzach sanya achas. I was once a guest at a certain place. So she prepared for me as follows. Asasali Pulin, she prepared for me beans. Biyamishna Khaltin, first day I ate them, Vlishyatim and Klum, I didn't leave anything over. Shniya the second day, 
Same thing happened. I ate it, and I completed the entire portion. On the third day, it so happens that she added too much salt, she burnt it, it was inedible. I took one taste, I pulled away from it. So she asked me, Rabbi, why are you not eating? Amartila, so I responded, I didn't want to insult her, I said, Kfar Sa'adi I already ate today. Amrali, so she told me, So you should have avoided the bread. Why do you avoid the main dish? Amrali, so then she said, Well, maybe there's something here. Rabbi, Perhaps the reason why you're not eating is because you neglected to leave some over, some food over during the previous days which is meant to be proper practice. But like HaKamu HaKamim, haven't the HaKamim told us as follows, Eim HaShayrin Pehbil, the servant who pours the food from the pot into the bowl, doesn't leave anything over in the in the pot for himself. Avul HaShayrin Pehbakar, but the guest is meant to leave something over in the bowl to serve the servant. So perhaps that's why you left some over now. You refrain from eating altogether because you remember that you have neglected this halacha. You didn't leave anything over in the previous days. So now you're making up for those days. So, Rishim Hananiah conceded defeat. Yeah, she was right. He was meant to leave some over from his food for the, um, for the Shams. What is the story with the Tanaik? It's a young girl. Tanaik is my. I was once walking along the road. This road this path was going right through a privately owned field. I was walking along. This young Tineke told me, Rabbi, isn't this a field that you're traversing? What right do you have to go through a privately owned field? I told her, isn't this a trodden path? It's a public access way. What's the problem? She told me, Robbers just like you trotted upon this path and trampled it and made it into a pathway. It doesn't justify things. It's privately owned. You're not meant to walk here. So she prevailed. Tino Ikmai. What is the story of the young boy? I was once walking along the road and approaching a city. Very easy. I noticed this young boy sitting at the crossroads. And I asked him, What's the way to get to the city? Omar Ali says you have a choice between two. Zuk Tsarvarucha. This route is short, but it's very long. So we're going to see what he meant. He meant that it's short distance, but it's convoluted. It won't get you to the city. Vizu, however, the other road is Arucha. So as far as the distance, it's longer. Uktsara, but it's actually shorter because it's a more direct route. It will get you to the city. This is what he meant. But Rabbi Shua didn't probably understand. His intention. So I walked on the first one, which was Ktsara. I figured, short route, why not? So indeed it was a short route. It got me right near the city, but once I got to the city, I saw it was inaccessible, impassable. I see the city surrounded with gardens, orchards, no way to get through. So I went back. I went back. Amartili. And I went over to the child and said, Bni, hello, you're Martili. Sarah, didn't you tell me that it was a short route? Look, I couldn't get to the city. Amartili, so he told him, Fala your Martilacha. But didn't I tell you? Arucha. I said, Sarah, but then I added, Sarah of Arucha. This is what I had in mind. Yeah, it looks, looks short and convenient. But then you get stuck. You weren't meant to take that route. Rather, you should have taken the, the one which is Arucha, which is long, but Sarah gets you to the city. So, Rabbi Shua ben Hananiah was very impressed with his wisdom. I was so proud of him. I gave him a kiss on his, on his head. Although, he won me over. But I was so full of pride. I gave him a kiss. So, I and I told him, Ashreichim Yisrael. Fortunate are you, Kala Yisrael. Shukuchem chacham ngdeilumatem. You're all great wise people. Migdolchem batkotnechem. From your elders down to your youngest. So, although... He conceded defeat. He, he won him over. But he was so proud of him and he gave him a kiss. You know, there was once a story with the rugged Shavagoyen, Yosef Rozhin from the town of Dvinsk. 
who was a rav in the town alongside Rami Simcha of Dvinsk, the Arsameh. So Arsameh was a rav of the non Hasidic committee and the Rugged Shavagoyin, who was a, a master of Kal Kula and also very sharp, he was a rav of the Hasidim. So the story was that he was once sitting by Shalashudis in Shul and he was giving the drasha. And he quoted a Pusik. And from the back, suddenly a voice rings out. A voice of a young young boy. And he says, Rebbe, as Shtetan Shah Pasik Fakert, doesn't it say in the Pasik differently than you quoted? And everybody turned around and shocked the uh, sincere brazenness of this young child, all of six years old. And the Rogat Shava pointed to him to come up front. And the boy slowly makes his way up to the front and everybody's quivering. Rogat Shava was known as a very sharp, sharp person. The boy makes his way up to the, to the Rav. And he comes in beside him. The Rav turns to him, bends down, gives him a kiss on his forehead. Rishakti al Continues the Gemara. Rabbi Yerisiyak Lili have a ka'azal ba'urcha. He was traveling the road. Ashikhal Bruya. He encountered Bruya, who was the wife of Rameya. Amala. So he asked him for directions. Be'eze derech ne'echa lud. What's the road for us to go to lud? Which way to lud? Amala, so she told him. So he used four words, right? He said, Be'eze derech ne'echa lud. So she told him, Glili, shaita, you foolish fellow from Gala. Like hacham, hacham, then hacham teach us. Al tar b'sicham isha. One is not meant to engage in excess conversation with a woman. Why did you use four words to ask the question? You should have been more concise. That's all you need to say. Self-understood that you're asking for directions. So, use too many words. This is consistent with what we said earlier. The Bnei Yehudu are very precise and exact in their wording. Contrast with Bnei Gol. Continues the Gemara. Bruya, the same woman, encountered this Talmud of a Kugaris Belachisha, who was learning, but quietly, Bachabe, she kicked towards him. Amalei, she told him, like a like Doesn't the pasuk say Arucha Bakolu The Torah is set and organized. It is safeguard. What does this mean? Im Arucha Bara Mach Ivorim Shalcha Mishtameres. If it's embedded and absorbed and organized within your two forty eight Ivorim, meaning you invest your effort and your energy in Torah, you articulate it, you express it in words. Mishtameris will be safeguarded. Vimla, but otherwise you just sit there and mumble and whisper, Eina Mishtameris, you won't retain the Torah. You won't have the Shmira. You'll forget it. You're meant to learn expressing the words out loud. Okay, so in summary, we learned about the city's uh, municipal boundaries. We're meant to extend it up until the protrusion and then from there go ahead and create the Tchum. We proceeded with several machlekes between Rav and Shmuel. Number one, Ketad Ma'abr Nisa'arn. Is it spelled with an ayin, like a isha ubara, expectant woman? Or is it Ma'abr with an aleph, the limbs of the city? Maris Machpela is called Machpela due to the fact that it was a double tiered cave, or due to the fact that there were many couples buried within it. Vayib Me'am Rafal. Was that his real name? Was it really Nimrod? Vayokim Malachadash al was it a new Melech or the same old Pari who pretended not to know Yosef? He just renewed his Xeris and made them strict and severe against Kal Yisrael. We learned from Rabbi Yechanan that there's a tremendous gap between the abilities of the former generations and our generation. We learned about the Bnei Yehuda who paid close attention to the words of the Torah they learned from their Rebbe. This allowed them to retain it properly to attach simonim, to commit it to long-term memory. We learned about the Bnei Yehuda who were careful in their articulation and their diction, whether when it pertained to the retire or even worldly matters. We had the story of Rabbi Shoban Hanania, who conceded that there was an Isha, a Tineke Tineikis, who won him over. We concluded with two stories of Bruria, the wife of Rameya. In the first case, she opined that Risa Aglili spoke too much. In the second case, that the Talmud was speaking too little in order to truly retain the Torah, in order to express it. If it's embedded and absorbed throughout the entire body, the person invests his energy, his whole body into his Torah, then it gets properly absorbed and fused within him. 
Mishnah Maris, it's safeguarded within him.